Tom, I wanted your thoughts on this. Mm-hmm. Hugh Freeze and Auburn's coaching staff is, is hotter than a sumo wrestler in a fur sleeping bag next to a volcano right now in state. <laughs> All right, 2025. Yeah. I, have, I, have, I grew up in Auburn, keep up with everybody. I have never seen Auburn attack the state of Alabama like this. Right now for the 2025 class, They have the number two overall ranked player in the state, Jared Smith, just flipped from Alabama to Auburn. They got Malik Autry, number three, just is with Auburn. Number four, Ja'Caleb Falk from Highland Home, uh, just is with Auburn. Number five, Eric Winters from Enterprise is to Auburn. Number seven, Derek Smith from Selma is going to Auburn. Jordan Crawford, the eighth ranked overall player, going to Auburn from Birmingham. And Quan Fagans from Thompson and Alabaster, basically Birmingham, yeah. going to Auburn. And then Antonio Coleman, right, obviously related to, to the Antonio Coleman that played at Auburn, from Sarah yeah. Land in Mobile mm-hmm. is going to Auburn. Tom, I, Kalen DeBoer, Alabama's recruiting great, right? Oh, but sure. I have never, yeah. I, had an, I had an SEC assistant coach today, a guy we've had on the show before, text me about 30 minutes before we went on and say Auburn is not messing around there, not playing around this is as ferocious as they've seen Auburn, not only in getting guys to listen, but right now getting guys to commit. Have you ever seen anything like this in the state of Alabama for Auburn? Well, no, not in the state of Alabama for Auburn. I've seen them go on really strong runs in terms of personnel and recruiting classes before. Um, but that's that's a different that's a different state, man. Because you know, for example, Ohio State doesn't have a peer in the state of Ohio. We've got some yeah. MAC teams, right? And you've got Cincinnati. Um, out of the Big 12, but you don't have a true competitor and a peer um, like a program like Alabama. Now, the one thing I will say in all of this, because a lot of those have been recent flips, right? You're seeing on-campus visits, unofficial visits, attending camps, and this is the thing that I've learned over the last 20 years on, on this subject is, first of all, every one of these guys is like having a 500 pound Marlin on the line, Mm. but he's 500 yards away. And it's going to take a long time to reel them in because this is a marathon. It's not a sprint for sure. And these kids and, and listen, I, I, I get it. I've been in the position too. If you've ever taken an official visit and they're rolling out the red carpet and you feel like a million bucks and everything is right. Everything's perfect. You come away from that visit. But what happens is, is you've got to allow yourself to take that 72 hour decompression period, sit back, take it all in, before you start making changes mm-hmm. and shifts and judgments and switches. And we probably don't do enough of that with young people. And I get it. They're prisoners of the moment. It, it's so exciting. But we, we see a lot of that. And that's not just exclusive to a tug of war between Alabama and Auburn recruiting. Uh, I would say that's been, by and large, you know, pretty true, particularly over the last three to five years, and especially since name, image, and likeness got involved. Because that, more than anything else now, is the driving force. I'm not saying it should be. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not saying we shouldn't have it. I'm just saying it is a much more significant factor. And if you are a university, and I know Auburn is, and Alabama is as well, but if you're in a university that's willing to push all your chips to the table in that regard, then you're going to have some success. Yeah. No, and and David, it's one of those things where a lot of times in state, when you look at the state of Alabama, it's not just who is committing where, it's where they're from. I cannot tell you the last mm-hmm. time I remember Auburn going and flipping a player from Mobile that wasn't Mobile. a legacy yeah. from Alabama like they did with Perry Thompson last year at Foley. Now you've got Antonio Coleman, who is a legacy from Sarah Land down there, but but it's Birmingham, it's Mobile, it's the smaller counties. Make no mistake, Alabama football is the most popular within the state of Alabama when it comes to Auburn, sure. especially when you get into the smaller counties. But the last part of this puzzle, and to go to your point, Tom, before we shift, for Auburn to be able to be operating at its highest efficient, efficiency and hitting on all cylinders, the la- and this is obvious, but it's very true and it's very important, the last ingredient in this recipe is on-the-field success. They've got incredible resources, a brand-new state-of-the-art facility. The fan base is aligned. The administration is aligned. The donors are aligned. The players are aligned. And that, that doesn't happen a lot at Auburn. The last thing now is can, now you got to win. The, if Auburn can go eight and four, and I know that's not the standard to Auburn, but sometimes reality has to be accepted. Just to have something to show to these recruits and say, look, 
The on-the-field progress is matching up with all the stuff I've sat here for the last two years in your living room and told you. If yeah. Auburn can do that, the fight is real, and Auburn will come back to relevance very quickly. Mm. And then you got to keep that's them what, from that's transferring what immediately. Clemson. That's exactly right. That's exactly Dabo right. Dabo did it Clemson his first five years. Yep. Yep. Well, to and that then, point yeah, on Clemson, right. you got to keep him from transferring, David. You're exactly yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, in this day yeah. and age, then you got to put in the the time that it takes to keep him from transferring. But talking about Clemson, let's talk about the ACC. We were highlighting each team last week during the ACC media days. I mean, the prevailing narrative on a team like Clemson, right, is oh well, you know, they still have some really good players, but Dabo Sweeney hadn't embraced the transfer portal, and Clay Cade Klubnick has limitations. Mm-hmm. For Florida State, oh, they'll return some really good players from an undefeated, uh, you know, regular season, uh, but they're going to start DJ Uangalale, who's already left Clemson and multiple programs. You know, I mean, meanwhile, the conference seems to be up for grabs. You have programs on the rise like a Georgia Tech or like a Virginia Tech Syracuse that we've been talking about. I'm still really bullish on Miami. I know people are criticizing yeah. Mario Cristobal and some of the decisions he made. I think they landed the, the, the best quarterback in the transfer portal in Cam Ward who decided not yeah. to go to the NFL. I mean, as we sit here right now with fall camp about to start, who's going to win the ACC? It's a great question. I don't have a definitive answer yet. Um, I do think that if we see a step taken by Cade Klubnick and we get some speed infused at the offensive skill spots at Clemson, I think it's going to come from two young guys, Bryant Wesco and TJ Moore. They're both true freshmen. They can flat out run. And they were lacking that a year ago. And they were banged up. You know, they Mm -hmm. ended up leaning on a true freshman in Tyler Brown last year because everybody else was hurt. If they make that improvement on offense, they're loaded on defense. They would be the team that I would probably say say has the leg up. Now, the thing that's interesting, and I heard this, I was covering Big 12 Media Days, and then I I heard it repeatedly with the coverage of SEC Media Days, and when I was at the ACC this past week, is the question of, well, how many playoff caliber teams do do these conferences have, right, Mm -hmm. now that we've expanded to 12? And I think that's the wrong question, because the reality is there's a handful of teams in in college football that could actually run that gauntlet, Mm -hmm. all right, and actually win the national championship. So the question I think we should be asking is, how many teams do you have in whatever conference your team is in, whatever conference you're rooting for, how many teams do you have that could get to 10-2 and two or better? Because that's, that's the question you have to ask yourself to be in the conversation in the month of November for that 8-12 to 12 slot in the college football playoff. And so mm-hmm. you asked me about the ACC. If Virginia Tech doesn't get caught up in reading their press clippings and everybody patting them on the back, I don't know if you looked at their schedule. Yep. They might have to screw it up not to go 10 and 2. Right? Yeah. NC State's going to be really good. They could go 10 and 2 or better. You mentioned Miami, Clemson. Um, I'm a little bit, I have a little bit of a wait and see with Florida State right now because I feel like our sample size of DJ Uwe Ungalale is big enough now that what when he tells us who he is, we need to start believing him, mm-hmm. right? And I understand that he had a pretty good QBR rating and he was, you know, threw 22 touchdowns and he threw for a good amount of yards last year. You know what he didn't do? He didn't complete over 58% of his passes in today's age of college football, you know? And had he be, if he was coming into Florida State with all of those other guys around him that Jordan Travis had the last three years, now me we might be having a bit of a different conversation, mm-hmm. but I do. I think it's ten and two or better. That's what you got to have as a conference, regardless of the conference, to put yourself in the conversation. Yeah, yeah. All right, Tom. Great seeing you, brother. We're going to go to Maxion Action. He wants to know who should I trust more, Colorado or Nebraska? Nebraska. Agreed. Um, and I say Nebraska because I honestly think they may start seven and zero. If you look at the schedule, mm-hmm. again, schedule, man, it matters. Yeah. It really matters. And, you know, they're going to get Colorado and Lincoln this time, right? Uh, I understand they've got a freshman quarterback, but he is really, really gifted. He's very talented. I do think they've upgraded the football team overall around him. And the other reason why I would say this is at both Baylor and Temple, heading into year two, Matt Rule had a plus – turnover of four or more games win total in each of those second iterations hmm. when he was at Temple and Baylor. So we're going to see a jump for Nebraska. How good is it? I don't know. How good are they? Put it this way. If they started off 6-1 and one and 7-0, and oh, do I think they're that good? No. I think the schedules afforded them to do that, and I believe that they've improved, and then time will tell. Without a doubt. 
All right, let's go to Mr. E. He wants to know, hashtag Ask Lugs, what game outside of the SEC Big Ten will mean the most for the college football playoff? Outside of the SEC and the Big Ten. It's mm, a good one. Oh. It will be Texas A&M and somebody. Because I think if, I think if Connor Wegman stays healthy, they're going to be really good. I think I th- so, too. I think they're, they're a dark horse team in the SEC. I know you said outside of the SEC. But well, they are playing Notre Dame week one, Tom. To me, to me, that feels like there it's a go. huge game for both programs. But I, I do think it's a bigger game for Notre Dame because if they, they don't have a conference they're in. There is no yeah. – co- so it's all regular season, and you know the committee wants to put Notre Dame in there as bad as humanly possible. So they're going to have to give sure. the committee a reason not to put them in there. But A&M, you can rebound. But I'm, I'm telling you right now, again, we don't make our picks till later, but it's going to be hard for me not to pick Texas A&M in that game. I, know, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and again, if Wegman stays healthy, I think he's really, really good. And they got players, man. Like yeah, they do. he inherited some good football players. Um, and so I, you know, that one will be interesting. You know, it, I'm trying is to Florida think State Memphis? The, is Florida State Memphis? Do you that's think a, a game? Scary that, game. Yeah, that's a scary game. That's the equivalent of Colorado scheduling North Dakota State. Yeah, yeah. Because when North Dakota State lines up in twenty-three personnel. True. And goes full blown ISO power counter, and runs that game in a phone booth. Yeah, that's, that's going to be an interesting Thursday night game, man. That's no fun. Not only is it painful, it's also somewhat boring to some people. Uh, last question, Lugs here. <laughs> you know, you you talked about this a second ago. You know, how many teams can get to ten and two? I keep seeing our audience members and fans of college football say, which between the Big Ten and the SEC. Which league can get four teams in? Or what one of those leagues will get four teams in? I'm looking around doing the math, Tom, and for a league to get four teams in, that's a whole hell of a lot if you think the SEC and the Big Ten are both going to get at least three in. Because if you right. do the math on that, if one of those conferences gets four in and the other one gets three in, yeah, that's two automatic qualifiers, but that's five more spots. And you're looking at five spots left with an automatic qualifier from the ACC and the Big 12. So three Mm -hmm. spots left. And that's not saying if Notre Dame's going to get in or not. I mean, do you think any conference will get four teams in the college football playoff? I think it would be really, really difficult. Uh, You know, you'd have to have have a couple of teams probably that don't play each other in the regular rotation, right? So um, I think you'd have to maybe have an undefeated, maybe – Maybe two. I don't know. Maybe maybe one uh, or two. One loss, an undefeated, and a ten and two. Maybe that would do it. Um, it's funny when you bring up this question because the team nobody's talking about in all of this is Iowa. Yeah, like Iowa, if they can cross the fifty yard line, has like nineteen starters back, their tight end back, their quarterback back, and I think they're going to be obviously much better coached on offense. They're going to be in the mix on on this. I think they're as much in the mix for a college football playoff in the Big Ten as Michigan or Penn State is. Well, I, you know what I feel like? I feel like it's kind of Iowa is inverse LSU right now. Like, their, yeah. their, yeah. their room it's for really growth awesome. potential is through the roof because one side of the ball was so awful. Like, LSU's yeah. defense doesn't have to be a top 10 defense in the country. They'll probably be a top 25 offense with what they have in that offensive mm-hmm. line. So just be a top 40 defense. You're a top 40 that's defense. Were, LSU's a problem. It, yeah, if yeah. Iowa has an offense that's in the top 50, good God, they might not lose a game. So, Tom, are right. you saying nine and threes off the table for the college football playoff? I think it would be very, very tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were talking about somebody's that. quarterback better be hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that. Well, that. And like, okay. Well, who are your three losses to? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's going to come under consideration. But I think you would be you'd be teetering on looking from the out or the outside looking in if you sat at that mark. And you know, that's why, you know, we all talk about, you know, well, who would you put in over this team, over that team when it was four? Well, we're gonna have that conversation twelve and thirteen yeah. and twelve and fourteen. And yeah. then you talk about splitting hairs, like really, what is the difference between the eleventh ranked and thirteenth ranked team in the country? What's the it's... difference between the twelfth and the fifteenth ranked team in the country? It's actually gonna be harder. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Tom, we have 68 teams that make the NCAA tournament. We still argue over teams that didn't get right. in over other ones of 68. So anybody that thought, you think those arguments were, were crucial too? Guys. Oh, God knows what's about to, The term on the bubble 
You want to talk about just people really getting nervous about first four in, next four out? Oh. That's going to be a real thing. We got to come up with our own terms for it, too. So I'll tell you, I've had more conversations this summer with coaches about like what it's going to take to actually get into the national championship game. Mm -hmm. The amount of snaps, the amount of bodies that you're going to need, the amount of luck, the amount of depth that you're going to have. And I'm talking about competitive depth. I'm talking about if you yeah. lose two or three guys in that first round of the playoffs and the next two to three come in and there's not a drop-off, all right, how many teams are structured and built that way? It's like that Clemson team that beat Alabama and Santa Clara. And remember Dexter Lawrence got caught with PEDs or whatever and didn't play in the college football playoff. Nobody noticed. Yeah, they were that good. Nobody, yeah. nobody even noticed. They were. I mean, Tyler Davis is a freshman. He walks right in like it was <laughs> like it was no big deal. Man, how many teams are capable of doing that? I mean, it yeah. is that is going to be a straight up battle of attrition. Well, Tom, there's not many guys that are capable of bringing the info that you bring to us, my friend. Tell everybody where the I know you're. I know you're all over the world this time of year. <laughs> By the way, I'm still just trying to figure out what that painting is in the background. I think it's a, a Matisse, but I can't figure it out. I'm not smart enough to. But, uh, man, tell everybody what you got going on right now, and obviously we're going to see you all over the TV and all over the Internet machine here soon. Well, right now I'm in Atlanta because I'm going over and I'm going to do a – you'll love this, David. I'm doing, we're doing our uh, some campus tours. I've got uh, five teams out of the ACC uh, this month, and we're starting off here at Tech. And I'm going to sit down with um, Haynes King tonight. Nice. And we're going we're gonna to take – one play from the break of the huddle, and we're going to have him walk us through from A to Z what's required of him on this play, pre-snap, through the snap, to the completion of the play, and have him knock it all out for us and kind of peel back the layer of the process by which you have to you know operate at that position and have him walk it through us. So we're going to do that tonight at uh, – six o'clock and then we're going to build our show around that and the practice uh tomorrow so i'm bouncing around doing that um i've got uh, right now i'm getting ready to put together what is maybe one of the most difficult things they asked me to do and that is to put together a freshman all-american team mm, and oof. good luck good luck finding two offensive tackles that you know are going <laughs> to yeah be started yeah down <laughs> you know, set right <laughs> Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. And so I'm getting ready to kind of put that together. Thank God Dylan Rayola. At least we know he's going to play in Nebraska. Yeah, so for sure. An easy one. I didn't, I didn't have a quarterback last year to use. I was hey, like, well, what, play. well, here's one tackle. Jordan Seaton at Colorado because God yeah, knows they one. need help there for sure. <laughs> I've jotted him down. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, Luke, Good thanks stuff, so much, man. buddy. You do a hell of a job. We can't yeah. wait to talk to you once Toe meets Leather. Sounds good, guys. Have a great one. What's up, YouTube? If you thought the opening ceremonies of the Olympics were cool, please don't subscribe to this.